Turn in your Bibles with me to chapter 3 of First Peter. Follow along with me as I start reading from verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Please take your seats. Well, here's where we are in our text. You know what happened on Friday when Jesus was given over to be crucified? Dying that horrific death, suffering greatly until he breathed his last breath. And he died just once. Just once. One time, just one payment for your sins and mine. So he could reconcile us to God. That happened on Friday. And what we talked about last week was what happened on Saturday. And the text teaches us, he went, his body died, but he went, his spirit went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. And we, and we went through last week, these spirits who are in prison are not human souls. They're actual angelic beings, demons, that fell from heaven because in the days of Noah, when the, church, when, when the earth was a real mess, they chose, they lusted after human women, and they came out of heaven to possess the bodies of men, and impregnate these human women. Now, there, there, there is something here that I want you to see, because many people get confused with this. As, as he went to prison and he proclaimed to them, he didn't evangelize them. The word written in Greek is not evangelize. So he didn't go into this prison where the spirits were and say, I've got good news for you. I am the only Savior. He didn't do that. He proclaimed victory over Satan and death. And the spirits... We're, we're in a dark place. And this happened in the days of Noah. If you look at verse 20, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons were brought safely through water. Now, the big, maybe confusing thing for you is all of a sudden, what's the next word God wrote there? Baptism. Do you see then now? Do you sort of get the picture? Christ suffered. This is what happened on Friday. This is what happened on Saturday. Baptism starts out the next thought. What happened on Sunday? Well, that's what we're going to go through. You know this. You know what happened on Sunday. 
especially in this church. He is risen. Oh, Dad, now you know better than that. He is risen. Thank you. There is hope. Very well done. So we left off in verse 20. As Noah and his family were were being saved by the water that was used to flood the earth. And then in verse 21, about the meaning of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, what happened on Sunday and how do we live through this suffering? Well, uh, let's look at your notes there. The very first thing that I want you to see is what happened on, on Sunday is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Christ gives meaning to how people respond to the gospel. The first part of, of verse 21 says baptism, which corresponds, which means a thing resembling another, its counterpart. To this, you know, you know this. Noah lived in a time of great wickedness upon the earth, and there was a couple of reasons why God wanted him to build the ark. The first one being that Noah and his family were going to get on it and be rescued. The second reason is is that it was there. It was there so the people who didn't believe in God could see it. Like they're thinking, something's going to happen. Something's going on here. Now, remember, these original believers who I am writing to, have gone through and are in the process of going through great trials, great tribulations, severe persecution. I have just written about Christ and how he suffered once for sins and went through this horrible persecution to proclaim victory. And how Noah, being a righteous man, and he was a righteous man, who walked with God, was saved from God's judgment by what? Water. Well, baptism is just like this. But please, don't jump to any conclusions yet. Because many so-called Religious people have gotten this wrong. In fact, some of you may be already asking yourselves, well, tell us, Peter, how does the water of the flood in the Old Testament correspond on how baptism saves in the New Testament? Well, I am very glad you asked that. This is all about how people respond to the gospel. The first thing is the flood waters judged the sinful human race. Genesis 6:13 6, says, "And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth." So God flooded the earth because of its wickedness and allowed Noah and his family to be saved. Now, get the picture here. So they're floating on this big boat on top of the water. What do you think they see? Besides water, what do you think they see? Nothing. Nothing. You know why? Because the water was up over the highest mountain on the earth. You know what they saw? Nothing. Nothing. And this went on. 
for about 150 days. Have you ever thought about this? What's underneath the water? Think about this now. What's underneath the water? The ground, right? What else? Huh? Fish? What? People! Have you ever thought about that? The whole human race, except for Noah and his family, are underneath the water. You know what they are? Oh, you're good. <laughs> They're dead. You, you, you've heard it. You know what dead is? Oh, <laughs> you guys are good. They're dead. Nothing going on underneath the water. Everything's dead. The animals are dead. Everything's dead. Except for the animals they took with them. And they see nothing but, nothing but water and nothing else. Underneath the water is wickedness. Think about this. Immorality. Sin. And the people who died paid the price for that sin. The people underneath the water have paid the price for their immorality. The people underneath the water are dead in their trespasses and sin. Would you agree with that? They've been judged. And now they're buried with all the other stuff that was on the the earth. So when a believer comes to faith in Jesus Christ, and they place their faith in Him by accepting His free gift of salvation, and they're brought in baptism underneath the water, what does going underwater mean? Death. Are you you starting to see it now? Right? There, it signifies death. Buried in the likeness of his death. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. You start to see it now? So when I said about Noah and his family being saved by the water of the flood, baptism is like this. The waters judged the sinful human race. The flood waters also gave Noah and his family new life now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal and intensely desire to God for a good conscience. But then one day, you know the story. You know, you know what happened one day? The water started to subside. And things start to dry out. Then eventually God tells Noah... Get off the boat. Get off the boat. Go and multiply. Start fresh. Start new. So when a believer is brought up out of the water, Noah and his family were giving a they were given a new life. Start fresh. Start over. So when a believer who comes up out of the water in baptism, what do they have? New life. You start to see it now?
They're spiritually resurrected into a new life. But let me be clear, don't get, hump, don't get hung up on the thinking that it's the water that saves. The water saved them. Water and baptism doesn't save you. But think about this. The water of baptism is a picture of salvation. This is a wonderful text here in Romans. My brother Paul, really, he, he did a good job with this one. What shall we say then? Are we, to, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Ladies and gentlemen, even though the flood water saved Noah and his family, it cannot save a person or give them new life. If, if you think about it, when a new believer is baptized, it is a clear picture of what happens when that person finally comes to faith in Jesus Christ. But think, think about this. Who's underneath the water? The, uh, let me come back to that. It is a hope to those who are finally tired of their sin, guilt, and eternal damnation. The last part of that verse says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this happens when God's, whole, when God's Holy Spirit begins to work in someone's mind and their heart and their conscience starts to be convicted because of who they are, what they've done, and, and, and they start to be convicted. And then they start to get worried about where they're going to stand in eternity. When someone comes to faith in Christ, they are cleansed from their sin. And their conscience gets right with God. Now, the question begs me here is what about your conscience? Because the people underneath the water are people who wouldn't give up, who would not get, give up their sinful lifestyle. Right? They wouldn't give it up. They were so busy being wicked and immorality. And please, please, please don't sit here and think that, 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 none, that any of us are any better than what they were. Please, don't, don't do that. But these people who died and who are underneath the water, who Noah and his family on the ark are floating above, refuse to give up their sinful lifestyle. They refused God. And it ended up costing them not only physical death, but eternal death. Eternal separation from God. The picture of salvation here, the baptism, it is a hope to those who finally, who finally get tired of sin and guilt and eternal damnation. Let me ask you one more question here. Are, are you tired of any sin that is in your life right now? Have you come to your wit's end over it? People who finally get tired of living the wrong way. Salvation is only possible through what happened on Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's it. Otherwise, you know what we, you know what we have? Nothing. 
Besides water, what did they look out and see? Nothing. Without the resurrection, what happened on Sunday, we have nothing. And the believers who place their faith in Christ don't die in their sin because their payment has already been paid. And when we die to ourselves, we are buried with him and spiritually resurrected to a new life. That's what it signifies. Because, I, and I tried to get this point across because I knew somebody would take this uh, out of context. When I said baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. Not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. That's when, that's when God's Spirit finally gets to the mind and to the heart, and that person softens themselves and comes to Christ. It's not the water. It was the water for Noah. It's not the water for us. Don't forget the people who are underneath the water and Noah and his family are floating over them. These are people who are dead. Dead in their trespasses and sin. And in the book of Ephesians, before you came to faith in Jesus Christ, what were you? Dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead. It's a picture of the gospel. It is a confidence that God brings victory through persecution. Remember... Please, remember who I'm writing to here. Why? Think about this. Why would I say Jesus Christ suffered once? The the righteous for the unrighteous. And, and, And after he physically died, his spirit went to this prison where, where the spirits were to proclaim victory. And Noah, and in the, because in the days of Noah, when God was patient, they did a horrible thing. A horrible thing. And God saved Noah's family by water. Baptism. Corresponds to this. How? Because at once, at one time you were dead. In your trespasses and sin. And through baptism, the example is you died to yourself and you rose to a new life. Because for people going through persecution, like, like the, the first readers, they got it tough. I'm trying to encourage them to keep going on. Keep persevering, even in the midst of persecution. Why? Because what your Savior did for you, and you. You tired yet? Are you tired from the sin you won't give up? When are you going to do it? Because this confidence that bring, that Christ brings victory through persecution is even in the persecution, you got somebody coming after you now? You got somebody per- persecuting right now? What does the end of that verse say? Who is subjected to Jesus Christ? Everything. Actually, when it comes down to it, we don't have anybody or anything to fear. So when you're going through suffering, like what these people are, when you're really hurting, when, when the trials get overwhelming, and, and many times 
in the, in, in the spiritual warfare, Satan will. Satan will make your life miserable. But I have hope with this. You know why? Because it says, who has gone into heaven, good theme today, heaven. And is at the right hand of God where angels, authorities, and powers have been subjected to him. Case closed. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that even in the midst of persecution, that we can look at your resurrection and what you did for us, all of the suffering that you did for that you did for us, and, and, and by coming to faith in you, that, that when we are biblically obedient and are baptized, we let people know what spiritually happened to us through the work of your Holy Spirit. That we spiritually died to ourselves, and we are spiritually risen to a new life in you. What an example that baptism gives. But Lord, I know, Lord, I know there is somebody here today that is struggling with some sin in their life. And the same way that these people who were underneath the water, as Noah and his family are floating along waiting for you to do, to, to do your thing uh, until it's ready, until the earth is ready for them to get back on it, Lord, That water covered up all of those sins. And there could be, in fact, somebody here today covering up a sin. Nobody knows about it but you and them. I ask you, Lord, that you would speak to their heart right now. Lord, please. Know that, uh, uh, Lord, help them to know that you are a, a loving God, a gracious God, a merciful God, Lord, but you also are just. And the judgment you reigned upon the earth with the flood was just. The discipline and, and the chastening you give us are, are just. And I ask you, Lord, not only for my heart, but for every heart here, that you would speak to our hearts please, and help us to get right with you. If there's anybody here, if there's anybody here, Lord, that really has has no assurance that they are going to go to heaven, Lord, help them, please, speak to their hearts so they're not stuck underneath the water. Please. And help them come to faith in you by accepting that free gift. Keep working on us, Lord. Don't give up on us, please. Mold us in, into the image of your Son that we may live our lives for that. Start with me. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Start with me. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. Start with me.